Hey, Pamela. Hello. How's it going there? It's going well. How are things going there? Good. Look, it's it's kind of sunny. Yay! It's sunny here, and the world is like filled with baby critters. Everywhere I go, I'm finding more baby critters. And you know what? Anyone who thinks the country is quiet has not lived in a world filled with baby birds. Yeah, yeah. There's a zillion <laughs> birds outside. There's one bird that just sits on this birdhouse outside the window. I think he uses it and just is so loud, just singing. For, <laughs> I'm not sure why. But, I, I'd be happy if they sang. Ours are mostly sparrows that just sort of yell at each other. Yeah. Um, but I did run across a whole bunch of tiny little baby birds in the forest. It was still adorable. We walked past. It was like a cluster of them all like but, hanging out with each other. With them. And they were all like little miniature versions, and there was a mom showing them how to fly. It was just it was awesome. That's, that's cool. Our, yeah. Ours aren't nearly that grown up yet. Ours are all at the... <laughs> I would say there's a lot of mama birds carrying worms yeah. back to the nest and things like that. Well, get some pictures. I, I tried. I, yeah. I posted a couple last night. They they are awkwardly located. Mm -hmm. The pictures or the birds? The birds. The pictures mm -hmm. are on Google+. Plus. The birds are between the grapevines and the trellis. Mm. Um, okay, so uh, for those of you who have no idea what this is that you stumbled into, apart from a conversation <laughs> on birding, uh, this is going to be a live episode of Astronomy Cast, uh, episode uh, 346, yes. Area 51. So we're continuing on our list of numbered episodes. Last time we did Launch Complex 39, this time we did Area 51, and you wanted to do, what's next week? You wanted to do... Um, uh, Longwood 2, the building that NASA headquarters is right. in. Okay. Uh, okay, cool. And so we'll take about, well, typically about 28 minutes to record the episode, and then uh, we'll wrap that up, and then we'll take your questions about space and astronomy. So I'm going to do some shouting out, shouting out to some of our uh, some of our regulars. So I'm going to say hi to Bert Walters, who says an opposite, op the awesome part of having a couple of days off is watching Astronomy Cast live. Uh, we're, we have a holiday here in Canada, so I don't know if Bert, it's also in Canada, but we have uh, Victoria Day. Oh, so, cool. Happy Victoria Day. And Kawhi Pulsar, afternoon everyone, awesome topic for today, let's hope. Thomas Tranaker, oh, I must take time to watch this, my disputation's in two days. Um, and Nancy Graziano, wow, it's all the regulars. Yeah. Peter Bibra, Elad Avron. There's a hey. few new names too. Yeah, well hey everybody. Um, okay. Are you ready, Dr. Pamela Gay? I, I believe I just might be. Can you ever I truly am... be ready to have a conversation about Area 51? No. Oh. All right. I'm ready to press record, though. I am, too. How does that sound? I pressed okay. record. It happened. I, I have now pressed it, too, and it's recording, and the levels are good, and I'm in mono. Hi, Preston. <laughs> Hi, Preston. Okay, here it goes. <laughs> Astronomy Cast, episode 346, Area 51. Welcome to his web. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not on my watch. It doesn't happen to me. All right. Do you want to just start the recording again so that yeah. just never even happened? Welcome. We welcome. Okay, ready? <laughs> I am pressing record. It's recording, and the levels are still good. Got me too. No All right. Question. Astronomy Cast, episode 346, Area 51. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane, I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Great. How are you enjoying your spring so far? Oh my gosh, it's it's other than being filled with pollen from dogwood trees, which is evil, it's filled with baby birds and baby groundhogs and baby sheep and baby geese, and so basically spring has sprung out with baby critters everywhere. I always forget how vibrant and green it is here on the West Coast. You know, living in a coastal temperate rainforest, during the rain part, the warm part, it's just, it's so green and there's flowers everywhere, it's Awesome, but yeah, same same deal. Which is the the allergies? Where I, for me, the allergies manifest. I just I just feel dumb. 
I can't think straight. I, I yeah, Friday. I I there there was no thoughts capable, and I have to admit I did take allergy medicine. So while I look a bit perkier, hopefully I'll manage to keep the stupid out of astronomy cast. But if if things are a little bit slower, it's it's the Benadryl haze. Yeah, no guarantees for me. Uh, all right, so who knows what mysteries lurk at the military's Area 51 complex in Nevada? Conspiracy theorists and UFO chasers think it's a big alien cover-up, but it's probably something more boring, like advanced military aircraft. So let's talk about what we know and what we think we know about this infamous military base. So, P Pamela, you put this one on the list, um, so you're going to have to put this in context. What? Why did you decide that an episode about Area 51 was appropriate for Astronomy Cast? I'm all because, ears. <laughs> because of all of the test planes that came out of there. As, as we start to talk about commercial space more and more, as commercial space starts to get more and more successful, understanding... Uh, all of these big, uh, essentially dry lake bed test facilities becomes more and more important. And Area 51 has been accused of many things, but the reality is this is just one more place that really awesome spacecraft that probe the top of the atmosphere and get called airplanes uh, have gotten to fly out of. Okay, so so set the stage then. Where where is Area Fifty One? What is it? What does it look like? What's what's the deal? Well, when you look at satellite imagery of it, and and in fact, there's really nice imagery of it in Google Maps, which kind of surprised me and thrilled me simultaneously. It is uh, first and foremost a giant dry lake bed, a great one of the salt flats that, that's out in Nevada. Um, it's located not too terribly far away from Las Vegas and in fact the folks that worked there uh, largely commuted by airplane from either Edwards Air Force Base to uh, Area 51 is often called Groom Lake um, or they flew out of Vegas's uh, McCarran Airport to fly down to Area 51. So you have this flat, 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 nature-provided landing area where actually the first people who scouted it out just landed their aircraft on the dry lake bed realizing this is some place that we don't even really have to groom. And while it does have one really nice paved landing strip, um, there, there are two landing strips that are basically just painted markings on the, the dry lake bed and should push come to shove, you can just kind of land at whatever angle you feel like it on approach. What creates a feature like this? Because I know uh, there's various, uh, there's a bunch of these around the world, right? And they're just like this ultra flat, salt kind of dusty, sandy, muddy expanse. What's you know, Burning Man Festival is is done on one of these. So what's so what is what creates these kinds of places? Uh, I mean, America dried out in that area. It's it's a former lake used to be there, and it's no longer supported by the geography. There's no longer sufficient rain. There's no longer sufficient runoff. And the neat thing about lakes is because they don't have currents tearing up the bottom of them and uh, if they aren't stream fed they have no reason to not be perfectly flat on the bottom so you have sediment settles out and in the past this region had a lot of salts in it and it still has the salts but it no longer has the salt lakes other than the Great Salt Lake and so you just end up with this beautifully flat bottom of a lake and remove the lake and you're left with this beautifully flat area in the bottom of a small valley. Yeah, it's amazing how, how all that sediment has gone down and filled in the bottom of whatever was this geographic feature and then has perfectly smoothed out at the bottom of the lake. And then when the lake was gone, you're left with, you couldn't have asked for a flatter place. It's, the the it's, best way to think of it is, it, I don't know about you, but out in the barn we'll periodically leave out a bucket and it will get filled with, with mud and everything else. Um, rainwater, dust, pollen all settling in from the atmosphere and you look at it this time of year and it's this slimy algae riddled mess. Come August it's going to be a quarter inch deep in the bottom with perfectly level 
grossness, but yeah. it's going to be dry grossness. At right, point. exactly. Um, okay, great. So they picked this place that was just like the best place to land aircraft. Yeah. And and if and I guess they were like, what if we need something that needs an extra long runway? Just use more lake bed. Doesn't really matter. And that that's actually one of the really cool things about this is is. It's it's not the only one like it. Edwards Air Force Base is actually fairly similar in terms of nice, dry lake bed, essentially. And the problem with Edwards that is why they needed Groom Lake, Area 51, is uh, Edwards is kind of in a well-witnessed area. And if you're going to be flying things you don't want anyone seeing, Edwards is out. So when they went searching for a new place, uh, they found some place that, from from the air looked a lot like area looked a lot like Edwards in terms of geographic characteristics, and when they put in the biggest landing strip, um, instead of having it dead end into the sagebrush, it dead ends into the lake bed and takes a big loop so that if if for some reason you overshoot the landing strip, you just keep going and take what the pilots call the hook and loop yourself around and sort of leave yourself marooned out in the lake bed, but that's better than being marooned in the sagebrush. Right, and then as you said, it's fairly private. There's not a lot of good views of the actual facility, and so you won't necessarily be able to see the aircraft landing. Okay, so, so we've got this great facility, and so what what has it been been used for historically? Well, it, it first started to get used in 1942 uh, as Indian Springs Air Force Auxiliary Field. Uh, it was just a couple of painted runways. Um, but after World War II, and as we started realizing we need spy planes, the real reason that it, it really grew was the U-2 program. And the, the U-2s is why I felt okay putting this on our list of things to do, because a U-2 is just short of being a suborbital aircraft. It, it doesn't actually get high enough up that you can call what it does a suborbital flight, but it goes high enough up that uh, you're sufficiently above the atmosphere that stars start to become a possibility. So when they started building this amazing aircraft, they needed some place that there wouldn't be peering eyes. Um, the U-2s got transported there in all sorts of neat and interesting hidden ways. Uh, some of the assembly took place there. When they were originally test flying them, they'd actually heard all of the staff that didn't have sufficient clearance into the cafeteria so they wouldn't see the takeoffs and landings. Um, our spy planes is really why Area 51 came into existence. And from the spy planes, it just kind of grew where we had uh, some of the early test aircraft that were used to build towards the modern stealth aircraft uh, flew out of there. There was the A-12 that looks a lot like a flying wedge. Um, there's still, I'm sure, aircraft that haven't been uh, declassified enough for us to know about them. One of the most frequent rumors was the Aurora spacecraft uh, getting seen. Um, I'm not quite sure how you describe its flight. Uh, getting seen doing its not quite normal activity uh, out of Area 51. So what was the Aurora? Um, it, it was another flying wedge technology that looked very much like a, a quintessential UFO. So you have a big flying triangle. Es essentially, Lockheed found a couple of different ways um, to build up the UFO lore here in the United States. Uh, there is a um, very rarely talked about uh, dirigible that is triangle shaped, moves quite slowly, um, and is a heavy lift vehicle that there's been plans published here and there um, that it's fairly clear that some of the triangular sightings that you see specifically in the part of the country I live in, in the St. Louis region, is just this Lockheed built dirigible being mistaken for a UFO. And then the Aurora is essentially a scramjet that is 
shaped like a nice, friendly little isosceles triangle with potentially not so friendly capabilities. And it's never really been declassified, but you do Google searches, you find information about it. All right, so you know I'm going to ask this question, yes. which is what's with all the aliens? That actually, if you're going to stick aliens anywhere, I can see why people would imagine sticking them there. Over the decades, America has managed to get its hands on a variety of different international aircraft, not always by the most legal of means. We've gotten various mings from people defecting, uh, most notably during the first Iraqi war during Desert Storm. There was a pilot who, when asked to napalm um, villages, essentially said no and instead of napalming the Kurds, flew his plane to Israel, uh, defected to America, and that airplane ended up in Area 51, and it's not the only one that's ended up there. Since World War II, when America has acquired foreign technology, that technology has been shipped, flown, whatever means necessary to Area 51, where we actually staged war games with our own pilots flying both on the foreign technology and on the American-made technology to see who's going to win in a dogfight, what are the techn technological uh, skills that we need to figure out how to combat with our own airplanes, what are the weaknesses we need to learn to take advantage of. So I'm sure there were many rumors of the alien nationals at Area 51 and as you start ending up with rumors of well Roswell being an alien crash as you have uh, all of the abduction rumors running rampant it suddenly becomes easy to imagine that Area 51 this base so top secret that they fly the staff in and out flying them out of Burbank on Monday and back on Friday or in and out of Las Vegas. It's easy to imagine that someplace that top secret is also going to be where the aliens go to live. It's but, where you would take them. I mean, if it's there were where aliens, you would. it's absolutely where you would take the aliens yeah. and study them and study their, their fantastic flying machines. <laughs> and there's been enough... Uh, I, I fully believe in the strength of America to build weird-ass aircraft that are going to get mistaken for this, that, and every other manner of UFO. And um, Yeah, I wish... I mean, that's the thing. I mean, obviously, you, you need to conduct this kind of research. You need to perform these experiments, yeah. and you need to do it in a secret manner... But it makes me sad that I don't get to see all of the really <laughs> interesting ideas and the really cool experiments and the stuff that, you know, that doesn't work so great, but it, it was a really neat idea. Can we make a flying wing? Can we make something, you know, a scramjet? Yeah. Has anyone tried a nuclear-propelled aircraft? All kinds of stuff, right? And you can just imagine all these, these wacky experiments. And, and, and I'm sure, as you said, a lot of them would end up looking to the average eye like some kind of of alien saucer, especially when you think about some of these, you know, things like some of these vertical takeoff and landing craft with big rotors and and things like and things like that, like even like the Ospreys and things like that, which have these rotors that can go up and down and they can fly forward, or you know, and then you take it to the logical conclusion where you look at like the Avengers and you've got the shield hover right. carrier, you know? So so that kind of technology you're certain has been has been tested. And and in the nineteen fifties there was actually a supersonic um, saucer shaped plane and it was recently declassified. Um, I don't know if it actually flew. It was just one of those things that uh, I remember it pictures of it cropping up and I'm now pulling it pulling it up um, it was the Avra car and and so we created saucer shaped aircraft and then when you start looking at drones drone helicopters do not look like your standard search and search and rescue helicopter these are multi-rotor round little things that fly in all sorts of weird ways and drones 
I don't know if those in particular got tested out of Area 51, but the D-21 drone that, that launched off of the back of a jet did get flown out of Area 51. And so you can start to imagine farmers, tourists, uh, your Hunter S. Thomas uh, completely stoned crazies in the desert driving to Vegas and seeing these low-flying, rather small, circular helicoptery things, but only seeing the lights and mistaking them for extraordinarily distant, extremely fast-moving, much bigger vehicles. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's and there's like a, only a few locations I know that you can actually perceive the the test facility, and it's really far away, and you know, like some mountain, and you have to get to the top of that mountain. You can use a telescope, and you can maybe see aircraft landing, but for most of the area around Area 51, it's a really high security military place that if you even set foot on it, military folks are going to show up, and and arrest you if you if you don't get off that that property and so you can just imagine yeah because that's how you keep spies out right you don't want to let spies come in and report on what's going on so you have to have high security but I think for a lot of people that security is so terrifying that it makes them feel like it's like it's must be something extraterrestrial in in origin that's being hidden there right well and and there's something about the desert that just conjures up all of the haunted town, the the there's there's something creepy about it. So you're out in this land of tumbleweeds and rattlesnakes with men patrolling with big guns, motion sensors everywhere. And this is also part of the country that that when the military bought up the Groom Lake facility, they had to buy up the local mining uh issues so there's old abandoned mines and it's just plays into the creativity of the terrified human mind uh, from mine shafts to military men uh, there's a few episodes of Scooby-Doo just waiting to be played out where everyone imagines it's little green men and it's just a everyday occurrence and imagination taking the best of everyone so is there any idea, like, has, has NASA been involved at all in, in doing stuff out at Area 51? I, as far as I know, NASA hasn't. But you have to remember that there's a very fine line between the U.S. Air Force and its DOD projects and what NASA's been doing. Uh, there's currently two space planes that are taking turns uh, hitting endurance challenges. That's, that, those are DOD Air Force, not NASA. So when we look at space exploration, well, NASA's the civilian arm, but DOD and U.S. Air Force, they have their own branches of getting toward space. Yeah, I mean, I know people, we've mentioned this a couple of times, and I know we're going to have to do an episode on this, although, although the episode will mostly be us scratching our head and going, I don't really know very much about it. There's a space plane, a military space plane, that's been in orbit for like 500 days now. Yeah, Did you know it, that, people? <laughs> I, 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 it's it's the X thirty seven. Yeah. Uh, there there's two of them. No one knows exactly why they're up there. Um, I can only survive survive. I can only surmise that they're up there carrying something that we really want to bring back. Mm -hmm. Uh. And, and so you have to ask, what experiments are they doing? What data are they collecting that they don't want to send back using normal radio signals? Um, there's something nifty in orbit. And the X-37 program is one that used to belong to NASA. Uh, I believe the number got switched when the Air Force took over it. but. This was part of a plan that was originally put in place to head towards being able to launch humans into space in a much smaller configuration, and now it's long-duration military craft. 
Yeah. Um, and I love, I mean, I, we talked about aliens as one of the possible conspiracy theories that's going on about, about Area 51. And I love some of the other the other ideas. I mean, people just let their imaginations run oh, yeah. wild, you know. People are, obviously people think that that's where, that's where the government stores the crashed alien, all the collected alien military stuff that's, uh, you know, that crashed at Roswell and other places like that. But that that's where the aliens come to have their secret meetings with, with, I guess the politicians and the and the government, uh, or that they've got strange exotic weaponry that they're testing there, or weather control systems, or crazy. Hey, it's where the Stargate portal is, isn't that's it? That's where Star. Is it? <laughs> no, no, they're in the Cheyenne complex in. Uh, oh, you're right. They're Colorado. Right. Yeah, yeah, but I'm sure they often go back to Area 51. And yeah, they they do. There there was episodes. Yeah. 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 So so then, do you know if there's like a lot going there now? Because I mean, the last no. really big development that came out of out of Area 51 was the whole uh, the B environmental concern, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, so it, we don't really have a good place to store nuclear waste. And one of the the things that has been put forward is between the chemicals, the radioactive materials, and the this, that, and the other thing that isn't really good for human life, Area 51 is um, largely disused at the moment. The the weekly flights in and out have pretty much gone away. Uh, staffing is down to a much more skeleton level. And this is simply because it's just not the healthiest place to be anymore. And so, I mean, are they going to try and, like, what are they going to do with it? Well, what should they do with it? You have some place that's still top secret. It's now a toxic place to keep somewhat secret. Uh, there's dioxins, there's uh, dibenzofurane, there's just all of these horribly evil awful things out there. So sure we could clean it up but isn't it just better to the mythology of keeping people out to say dangerous chemicals you will die if you come here. Whoa that's uh, just part of the conspiracy theory. Well it, Considering that it was a bunch of university professors who, who came forward to say, look, this, this isn't a healthy place. We need to start thinking about this. I, I think the environmental concerns are, are quite valid. I, I just don't see a strong motivation to spend the millions of dollars to clean up some place where you have to grant high secret military clearance to everyone involved in the cleanup process. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so do you, I mean, is it going to be eventually just disused, it's just going to be abandoned and locked away and then that'll be that? I think that depends on the international political scene. I, for, for a long time it looked like uh, our need to have some place to test extremely top secret aircraft was going away. Uh, we're quite happily using drones in the Middle East. Well, not happily, but it's it's safer for pilots to send in drones instead of humans. Um, but it's it's hard to know what's going to happen in the next few years as tensions do begin to rise in Europe again. Um, the the fact that we're getting kicked off the International Space Station in in 2020. Um, it, it's I no longer know what the future brings. A couple, had we recorded this a couple weeks ago, uh, maybe a month ago, prior to the difficulties in the Ukraine, I'd be like, sure, it's going to get shut down. Uh, now I'm not so sure. And it's interesting now, sort of, we're transitioning to the to the drone age, where in the olden days you had a great big, you know, two hundred million dollar military aircraft flown by a pilot great long distances and and it was a very loud and messy affair and and we're now moving to this place where more and more of these aircraft are just are drones of varying sizes. Some are as big as a jet plane and others are, are really quite small and the miniaturization is is going at, at breakneck speeds and and you can kind of imagine this future where the surveillance, the um 
surveillance, even a lot of the military operations are done by these smaller, more inexpensive, less complicated, less like Manhattan Project style research projects. And so they can be tested in smaller areas. You don't need to be so so public about it. Right? There's only so many places you can land a B2, right? <laughs> While you can, you know, you can test out a a quadcopter with a with a gun on it in a fairly small space. So so that's probably starting to just chest, change the dynamics of the battle. So it's a it's a new era. It's a weird time. And and we really don't know where the world's going to go next. And are we going to need suborbital military aircraft? Are we going to need some place to build the military version of spaceship too? And it's questions like that that make the future of some place like Area 51 more uh, open to question. So you're not saying that it's aliens, but it's but No. It's aliens. Well, it's aliens from another country rather than another <laughs> world. Right, and their hardware. All right. Cool. Well, thanks a lot, Pamela. It's my pleasure. Now stay, and we will answer your questions. This was this show ended on a very depressing note. I shouldn't watch the news so much. It makes no. me a much sadder person. Aww. Um, save. I thought that, yeah. Is that my job? Is my job to stop you from going into these spirals <laughs> of, uh, of depression and... Uh, Export, yeah. No, it's the UN's job, not yours. They're just not doing quite as good a job at it. Um, I'll take over <laughs> from the UN. Step aside, UN. We got this. Okay. Done. I'm uploading. Allow me to focus. Okay. Um... Elad Avron says, what's so boring about advanced military aircraft? It's some of the best feats of engineering ever created by mankind. That, did you hear that? I have stomping children upstairs. It's a holiday, <laughs> Monday. Yeah. Um, you know, it's hi, folks. The Google search offers upon simply typing area and gives you about 744 million results. And Google Maps shows one heck of a runway image, which is exactly right. So there's the Iconos satellite and the... Oh... What's the other one? Orb View? So anyway, so yeah. there's a couple of these private satellite companies now that are offering their uh, satellite images to the to the public, and Google's one of the buyers of this, and they've got really high-resolution images of these, these areas. What used to be these satellite maps with big chunks redacted, now you can see every single runway, every single building, every single, all the markings, everything in that whole area. So, so go wild, conspiracy theorists. And uh, let me know if you see some alien spacecraft. Um, Steve Patterson says, Peterson says, uh, the U.S. government creates places like Area 51 and then spreads disrumors, and then you wonder why people think the Apollo landing was not real. And I think that's a really great point, is that the, the government, it's in their best interest to spread misinformation and confusion about what exactly is going on there and I'm sure for them if people want to think that it's aliens perfect you know as long as you don't think is that it's super advanced killing machines right <laughs> designed by human beings so I think that's um, I think that's the power of the creativity fine. of humans is kind yeah, of yeah yeah and, and I think that they that kind of backfired a bit with with the whole Roswell Incident, and they finally had to said, "No, it was just a high altitude weather balloon." Okay, people, right? Because because people were just getting themselves all worked up. But you know, you don't want to tell too much information about how you're using these high altitude weather balloons. So, um, Richard Strassel says, "Check out Project Pluto for an experimental nuclear powered ramjet." Awesome. <laughs> totally will. Project Pluto. I'm gonna look at that right now. That's awesome. Wow. So cool. Everybody do this. Check out Project Pluto. We gotta write an article on this on Universe Today. I'm gonna I'm gonna task Nancy with that. That sounds great. Um okay. What else? Um 
Thomas Rennickers. Ryan Crowbar. <laughs> uh, Sorry, I just went to Project Pluto and one of the searches came up with Flying Crowbar. Uh, Thomas Tranaker says that Sweden got the Delta Wing down during the 50s in see the Sab 35 Draken. Boy, it's yeah. sure it's a Delta and a Tailfin, but boy, it was fast. Yeah. So if you look at some of the uh, the European, like the Eurofighter and things like that, they have that Delta Wing look to them. Some of the uh, cool. Uh, Sylvan Westby says, "I'm here too." So Pamela, admit that you're part of the big scientific conspiracy to cover up extraterrestrial activity on Earth. Can you please admit this, Pamela? No, I'm happy to, to reveal it to the world. I'm just hoping it comes in the form of somewhere inside of a meteorite. Yeah. Um, where's, your, where's your check? Where's the check that we're waiting <laughs> for? If I, I had the check, people... I wouldn't be begging for money so much. I know. I love when people accuse us of, of being part of the NASA conspiracy cover-up and then we're, we're on the payroll for, for NASA and the government. Money, please. <laughs> Where's my money? I'll hide your alien uh, evidence. Um, Bert Walter says, can we do an episode on Project Icarus sometime? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, I love Project Icarus or Daedalus or some of those, some of those like big ideas for interstellar space flight and things like that. Was that Icarus? Icarus? Which one was Icarus? I don't know that one. But I would love to. I'm do... madly googling as these things yeah, go by because so I'm. Yeah, Icarus Interstellar. Okay, right. So that's that's the new folks that are trying to do an interstellar probe. I would love to do a like a series on crazy ed ideas from people in you know Project Orion and Daedalus and some of the really advanced ideas. Like we we did like the the mega engineering projects ideas like yeah. that. I love that kind of stuff, as you know. I get really excited. Um, what else we got? Any more questions? Come on, now's your chance. <laughs> Hugo Burnham you has just posted a bunch of yeah. Uh, Hugo Burnham has just posted a bunch of really cool uh, pictures of advanced aircraft into the into the event. They're so cool. <laughs> um. All right. Okay, here we go. Bert Wolters asks, uh, off topic, which is totally fine. We want off topic. Yeah. Um, could the difference in rotation speed just in and outside Venus's orbit in the protoplanetary disk explain why it's rotating the other way around? Does that make sense? No. Could the, di you know, the rotation speed just, well, you know, Venus. Yes, I see, no, 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 it makes sense. I'm answering the question. The answer to the question is no. No, okay. That you need some of this. Otherwise, all yeah. the planets would be like that. Right. Um, Franco, Franco Brozo suggests they should make a theme park out of Area 51. That would be great. Wouldn't that be great? It that, really would be. That they turn that, I mean, <laughs> Except for the whole poisonous yeah. part. Yeah, they decontaminate the place, and then you just show up, and like, here's the, here's the alien saucer ride, and then that would be awesome. You just imagine, like, some guy in an alien outfit showing up. Like, those are all the mascots. Oh, that would be the best. Um, Thomas Tranaker wants to know where you sign up for the NASA check. I do not mind hiding an alien. <laughs> now I know. I know. Like, I'll have an alien, like, hang out here, just bunk with me and get my check. Done. Uh, Michael Jobin says, another great Cosmos last night. Got any more Cosmos episodes? I haven't no. watched any of them. Sorry. Oh! I haven't seen this I one like, yet, but I've watched them all. Life is short. I know. Um, if you get picked as the host for next season's Cosmos, will you, will I, you watch them? I Yes. Well, actually, you know, I haven't seen most of the things I've been in. No, neither I, have I. That's funny. <laughs> I don't like to. I, uh, I don't like to watch it. I don't like to listen yeah. to it. I know I should, but I just sort of avoid it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, okay, cool. Well, I think I got all the big stuff. Uh, let me see if I got anything here. 
This is it. This is your chance. Don't you want to know what happens if you smash a black hole into um, black holes into I don't know planets? Why are there no green stars? Come on, there's got to be some crazy questions here. Um. <laughs> Chris Marshall over on YouTube says, quote of the day from Pamela, I'm sure America can create weird arsed spacecraft. <laughs> they sure can. Um, Aya T. Katu on YouTube says, it's getting Fraser in here? It's getting Fraser in here? I don't understand. I don't understand either, but perhaps there's a, that's, that's a way I behave. I'm not sure. Uh, ooh, Guido Bieber suggests Astronomy Cast live from Area 51. That would be a scoop. Uh, yeah, and Thomas Thomas agrees that you should host Cosmos next year. I'd love to do that. Yeah. I I I volunteer you. I I think you would be great. Um. Okay. I think I got everything. Got everything I need. So let's wrap this up. Well, hey, Pamela, thank you so much for providing your brain. We really appreciate it. And thanks, to everyone, for watching. It's just great to share this week with all of you. Um, aha! For Here's giving one. us things that I don't know that caused me to madly Google in case Fraser asks me a question. Are you ready? Are you ready? Oh, God. Here we go. Are white holes really impossible? Yes. They really are impossible. You okay. have to have a massless universe. And what color are brown dwarves? Aren't they kind of purple? I think I did an yeah, article about this. Yeah, they're kind of purpley, maroonish. It really depends on the temperature. Yeah. The older they get, the blacker they get. And that's from Mary Bradley. Yeah. That Thanks, one I Mary. Answer. I know. That was great. Um, all right. I'm going to wrap this up. Hey, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks, Pamela, for bringing your brain. We will see you all. What's next? Wednesday? Uh, yes. Wednesday is learning space. Nice. What's the topic? Do you know? No, I don't. Okay. And then Friday's the week's space hanging out. All right. We'll see you all later. Okay. <laughs> Bye-bye.